Cool. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Teresa Vidal Kaleja. I'm associate professor at the uh, UTS Robotics Institute, and I'm co lead of uh, Program One Biomimic uh, Robots. And today, Chao Chi and I are going <laughs> to, I'll let him introduce himself, but um, we're going to talk about um, robotics, uh, robot perception for autonomy and robots in material handling. And we'll, we're gonna, I'll talk first and then Chachu will talk and we can, but we can have questions in between if you want. Um, so Chachi can. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, I think you go first. I will just, yeah. Introduce later, your... okay, cool. Yeah. All right, so I'll share my screen. Cool. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about robot uh, perception in autonomy. Uh, this is uh, most of the work that I've done over all my research career. And uh, I'm going to give some examples of what. Uh, I've been working on, um, on on perception on the perception side, uh, but I'm gonna start just quickly by making it a little bit more relevant for the center. <laughs> uh, so I call it robot perception for autonomy. But after uh, listening to uh, Matthias talk a couple of weeks ago in the seminars of the center, um, I realized in the definition of cobot. Um, provided by COP and, uh, in 2021, uh, a cobot could be also um, a, a robot that coexists with people, right? So we have here the, um, the what Matthias defined as cobots is the one that a robot that coexists uh, with a human or cooperate or collaborate, right? Obviously we aim for collaboration, but um, I, coexistence, is, coexistence is also um, a cobot. Um, so I think most of my research has been in coexisting robots. And I added, if you, I don't know if you noticed, I added here a mobile robot. <laughs> um, because not only manipulators are robots, we also, um, uh, we also consider mobile bases or or even drones um, as cobots. And uh, and well, most of my work has been in this area. Robots that coexist with people don't necessarily cooperate or collaborate, but coexist with people and they are safe to be around with. Um, and the perception done uh, that I've done is it's um, mostly on mobile robots and and some in manipulation as well. All right, so um, uh, in the talk, I'm gonna talk a bit uh, of how I define robotic perception and the type of uh, algorithms uh, or the, the type of requirements that mob, uh, robot perception or the, yeah, the type of processing that robot perception requires to make more intelligent decisions. And then I'm going to go to some of the examples of my work in different types of sensing modalities like vision or 3D cameras or sound. OK, so robot perception, it's um, perception provides a robot the ability to perceive and understand the world through sensors to achieve intelligent, intelligently, or you can call it also autonomously, <laughs> there are specific tasks accounting for the sensors and uh, the, the, the uncertainties, right? Like sensors are mostly noisy and that's what we handle a lot in, in robotic perception. Um, so the, in the robotic perception is arguably the bottleneck of robotics to, to be 
fully autonomous or fully intelligent, right? It's how do we, how does robot, um, uh, do robots understand the world through sensors? And so we first need to model or to understand the behavior of our sensor. So which, or, or we also have to decide which sensor is the best to do the task that we require. So we, uh, we normally model the sensor. So for instance, in, if we are using vision, we need to do image processing, object detection, or um, I don't know, extraction of features, things like that. So um, modeling of sensors is understanding the behavior of the sensors and processing the signals, uh, reducing the amount of data. For instance, if we have an image for, uh, I don't know, six, um, uh, 640 by 480 pixels, it's a lot of data to handle at 30 frames per second, right? So um, we need to reduce the dimensionality of these. <clears throat> we need to characterize their noise because, yeah, um, we wish the sensors were perfect, but no, they always give us a little bit of error and we need to model these errors. We also need a representation, right? Uh, um, a representation of the environment or of the scene to be able to do our task. So sometimes we, um, it's sufficient to have sparse points in the environment because we want to localize our robot. But if we want to be able to manipulate an object, we might want a dense representation of the robot, of the, of the environment. So that's the other aspect that we need to look uh, um, while doing perception, developing perception algorithms. Then there is another aspect, which is the estimation, right? It, that this concerns usually to the, the data fusion, right? So how to put multiple um, observations of the thing that we are doing into a single representation. So representation and estimation are highly linked. Um, and we normally in robotics, we use these probabilistic algorithms to be able to fuse the, um, in, to fuse properly the, 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 the data over, over time or sequentially, uh, this noisy data of the sensor. So you can see how modeling, representation and estimation are highly linked. Uh, and that's what perception, robot perception, handles um, for, for, for uh, to make intelligent decisions. And then there is some kind of an associated aspect, which is not perception, that's decision making, which is a different thing. But um, I, I added it here because sometimes we want actions can help us to do, to, to improve our perception. So that's, that's what I put this, um, action as well as here. My work has incorporated actions that could help our perception algorithms behave better. Uh, so let's go to the different modalities and examples I've, uh, I've worked to the, um, well, in, in my career, and this is a, a very early one, uh, where we were looking at localizing a mobile robot outdoors or indoors, uh, through uh, using vision, right? And this is, yeah, as I said, an early work where we were looking at extracting features from images, so these points that you see here, and then uh, using those features to localize the robot, like the position in the world of the robot, and create a 3D map which is not very useful for anything else than localization, but we also get a 3D map of those points um, in, that we extracted in the image. So you can see, you can incorporate data over time. If we fuse it with a extended common factor that runs online. Um, SLAM stands for simultaneous localization and mapping, and you can see it's a lot of um, it, it covers a lot of the work that I've done in, over the over my career, like this this topic of localizing self localizing a robot and building a map uh, in the environment. So with vision based perception, we also have used 
these um, other representations, not only points, but also lines. For instance, if we want to do cooperation between a robot that looks and the, that sees things on the ground with vision and a robot that sees something um, from, the, from the air, uh, points are not enough. They are like point features in image. You cannot associate them. They have very different perspectives. But it turns out that other like high level features like lines, you can associate them. So in this work, we use lines and points to be able to localize robots uh, together and build a collaborative map of the environment uh, using vision. Uh, but I, yeah, I, in my research, I not only work with vision, I went further, uh, like work with other sensors, so sensors that could potentially be um, uh, complementary of, 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 of certain modalities. Oh, sorry, this thing is going. Um, all right, so for instance, uh, using vision and uh, another type of vision in a different um, part of the spectrum, for instance, uh, infrared. So if we could combine, if we combine this type of sensing, we could get uh, more robust localization. Uh, and we could, uh, for instance, avoid issues where there is a smoke on the, on the image and we, uh, those features are not very useful for localization. So if we could use the IR images to, to find those uh, points that um, to, to help the localization, well, that makes a lot of sense. And that's the work that we've done. Um, but not only for localization, but also, uh, well, a little bit of processing that allows us to detect what's the smoke and not the smoke. Like, and this is using machine learning to be able to the, uh, decide whether a feature in the image belongs to smoke or not smoke. And we decide from there what to use. Um, other type of uh, multi-sensor um, examples are, for instance, using uh, a work that I did as part of a project with Sydney Water is um, using vision and electromagnetic sensing to localize robots inside pipes. So in this case, we combine image in the uh, features in the images and detection of um, what it's called the joints where, where the pipes um, are put together are very easily uh, wait. I mean, um, in vision, you can see them, but not very well. Sometimes it's not a joint. But in, in the electromagnetic space, using electromagnetic sensor are super clear. You know exactly where a joint is. So combining these two modalities, we could localize a robot inside pipes. Uh, but not, to, I mean, electromagnetic sensor not only work for localization, you can do more things, right? We could do um, detection of, uh, the detection and sizing of defects, which is highly relevant for, for our water pipes because we want to um, know, we want to, in this case of, of water pipes, the aim is to detect when they're gonna break. So using electromagnetic sensor, we can uh, size the defect and, the, the, and detect exactly where it is once we are localized within the pipes. Uh, yeah, we also have also combined um, visual perception and uh, sound uh, perception, where uh, we have um, where we detect uh, sound sources, right? Like so, in this case, we have a microphone. Uh, sorry, a mobile phone ringing in the environment, and we are able to localize. The, the, the microphones in the same map as that we are localizing our robot using vision. Uh, and well, this is a similar, but instead of using only vision, we use 3D information and we can have a dense reconstruction of the environment 
and localizing at the same time the, the sound source. All right, some other work combines LIDAR and IMUs, uh, where, we, um, where we use the, these 3D LIDARs that you can see in the autonomous cars, uh, combined with IMUs to reconstruct a full indoor environment. And this, this, the LIDARs allows us to go like really long scale, like long scale, we can map full, um, I mean, full rooms for sure, full buildings, uh, or even like an outdoor environment, um, very, um, very large. And, and obviously we can then later localize in this environment. So, I mean, you can see this is very relevant in a manufacturing plant. If we can map the manufacturing plant, we can always localize our robots and our people within those maps. Um, all right, and then we can also, well, improve our maps through actions to have better actions to, um, to decide how, I can get um, a better map of the environment using a certain action. Or how can I calibrate my sensors? Because that's, that's the other bit of perception. Once you have more than one sensor, you need to know where these sensors are with respect to each other. You need to know if there is some time shift between those sensors to make be able to make um, good information fusion of this. Um, and, and of course, I mean, there are million combinations we could try, right? Like, because uh, using deep learning, we can detect objects in the environment with images. We could also make it more robust by detecting uh, these same objects in, in another modality and then make robust decisions or, or um, and, and I envision this will be very, these type of algorithms are very relevant for safety where you have, when one modality fails, you have the other one that tells you what to do. Um, some other uh, work with 3D cameras in rigid environments we have used, uh, for instance, just pro try to provide feedback of a uh, robotic 3D printing uh, a, a task by reconstructing the printing while it's being printed, right? Um, and then we've done that with certain representations, but we also have worked in representations that are more relevant for manipulation, where we get dense information and, and um, um, what we call meshes or, or very dense uh, point clouds. In this case, it's meshes. Um, so you, we can obtain uh, this very accurate and dense representation of the environment that can help us to do more um, other tasks like, uh, like um, manipulation, right? In this case is uh, not manipulation. In this case, we have a robot that is navigate, uh, that it's exploring or it's reconstructing these boxes, uh, but, um, in this case, we use a similar approach of the, the representation that we are building this dense representation to do uh, manipulation, right? In this case, the aim is we want to um, uh, get the, manipulate all these boxes and obviously autonomously. So the robot needs to localize itself, it needs to build a dense representation of these boxes and then decide where they're gonna where it's gonna pick them, pick them, remove them from the map, and then find the other box to pick. Um, so as you can see, it perception is very, it's a very important <laughs> um, I, it's key for intelligence and autonomy. Uh, and yeah, these ones I just want to show you like that we've done it with the real robot where uh, the robot finds the, the box, does the representation, decides which box to pick and um, so on and so forth. Um, 
another bit of perception and I'll probably wrap up. So, so Chauci can um, continue. It's uh, not, in so far I've talked about rigid perception where the objects are rigid. Um, but sometimes we have objects that are not rigid and I believe this, this will be relevant for some of our partners where we have objects to manipulate that are non-rigid. So we, I have, have done some uh, work on this non-rigid perception where we can um, uh, associate and build a better representation of, uh, of, of an object that it's not rigid. And of course, the other thing that we could do is track humans in the environment over time, in real time. And that uh, it's very important for, for, cobot, um, for, for human robot interaction, right? We want to see where our robots are in the world. And I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, this video doesn't work. But yeah, like the idea is to localize these robots in the world. Um, as they are moving, uh, sorry, these robots, the, the, the people in the world as they are moving uh, at all times. And well, that, this, this is another sensing modality, a new modality that it's called event-based cameras. I think it's relevant to talk about it because uh, this, this um, event-based cameras can detect motion at a very high frame rate. And I think it will be a, no, a very interesting modality for safety purposes. Uh, if there is something moving in the environment, the robot can stop and then we have uh, a good safety um, environment. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop there. And um, so what, what I, yeah, what I want us to think about is what's next? How can we use this type of perception in human robot interaction? And most in particular, uh, and in particular to in manufacturing tasks. And that's it. Thank you. And I'm gonna pass <laughs> the um, the screen to Tauchi. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Teresa, for the excellent presentation and the important topic on uh, uh, perception. So my name is Xiaoqi Chen. I co-lead for Program One and uh, currently. Deputy Director for Manufacturing Future the Research Institute at Sumba University. So um, given that background and, uh, and the sort of uh, importance of perception presented by Teresa, I thought I'd just focus on some case studies, uh, bring um, the cohort robots to uh, application grant and uh, what we can expect cobalt robots to, um, uh, to do in the and mature the process and specifically. So I'll give a few, a uh, couple of slides about background, of, you know, where I come from and uh, focus on sensing and machine learning for adaptive mature the process, uh, um, uh, including, you know, wording, grinding, uh, and lots of uh, complex operation. Then share with you the outlook and have some reflection on what we can do. So I actually, I was trained in uh, material processing, you know, wording and 3D, well, at that time we don't call it uh, additive manufacturing, but, were, but was actually additive manufacturing, right? Wording, grinding, polishing, uh, the tough things uh, around the robotics automation. Uh, also, uh, another strand of my research is uh, on uh, mobile robotics, you know, underwater vehicles, uh, fish robot and the uh, drones, even the forest robots, you know, and jump from tree to tree to do pruning and the fanning. Uh, one of them I'm proud and overcome from uh, the postgraduates would be the wall climbing robot, uh, which is uh, unique, it's untethered. I think it's the only one untethered operation uh, in a commercial environment. You see some of the tethered wall climbing robot. But our technology is an untethered wall climbing robot. Another recently, you know, particularly after kind of joining uh, Sumba University, and I have been thinking about uh, assistive robotics um, for rehabilitation or uh, assistance as a need, or even robots for um, biological operation, you know, doing manipulation on cells 
And lastly, it's a sort of emerging trend in the, and to apply uh, AI, deep learning, machine learning to solve a lot of problems and which cannot be easily overcome by just uh, explicit mathematical modeling. And materials process is a very important part. It's not just making new parts, new, uh, new products. It's also important in remanufacturing. Um, in large extent, remanufacturing is much more challenging than making new parts. You know, from engineering background, we all know that uh, new parts are competitive, uh, repetitive. By remanufacturing, we're dealing parts uh, individual, uh, has individual characteristics. Uh, geometries. So that requires um, uh, the intelligence adaptiveness in robotics and automation. Here's an example about remanufacturing in aerospace. Uh, it's perhaps a small industrial sector in Australia, but it's very big in states, Europe, and Asia. And it just a chart shows the growth of the value in maintenance, repair, and overhaul of aircraft key components. As you can see and understand, in Asia, it's uh, you know, uh, air, you know, air traffic uh, hub you know, and uh, contributes a large um, volume of the market. So it's, a, uh, it's a growing. Now, in this industry, we deal with uh, um, difficult to process materials, not just commonly seen, uh, mild steels. We talk about the materials. Uh, uh, making parts operating in a high pressure, high temperature environment, dealing with super alloys, right, titanium alloys. And um, uh, uh, it involves both additive and the subtractive manufacturing. So we need to build a part layer by layer, commonly uh, for repairing parts. So a lot of the parts are damaged and we have to build up, right? Once it's built up, then we have to uh, rely on secondary process and you know, the subtract materials to make a uh, final shape. And we call it a finishing. Right? Both can be done by uh, a robotic system with the various sensors. So, and uh, the motivation is, uh, you know, these materials are, you know, are developed and through um, conventional processing, casting, machining. But uh, in repair, uh, we have to work with the base of the materials, you know, whatever left over from materials. So recently, additive manufacturing has been a promising technology for remanufacturing in airspace, power generation, oil, gas, and nuclear plants, right? So it, give, it just provides a, a, a excellent freedom of design. So um, bring the robots to the, the plant and uh, to be adapt to the work environment and uh, and build the materials up. So that extends the flexibility and for repair, word repair for the secondary process and reduces the component assembly for complex applications. So these parts are scary, right? You would think it would be just discussed, but often have repaired. Why we need to repair rather than just replace the new components? Well, and let's uh, uh, economics behind, right? And we, you know, travel, you know, in the Ju July, we'll travel to Prince and KUT. So we take a uh, jet planes. In the uh, heart of the plane is, of course, the uh, engines. Engines consist of uh, hundreds of uh, turbine blades and then uh, vanes. You have a front end, the cold stage plants. You start with uh, um, fan, um, uh, the cold stage. Uh, uh, um, blades, then the central stage, you know, is really red hot, you know, operating environment is a, uh, uh, a thousand degrees, then the jet coming off will give it a proportion uh, for, the plane, for the plane. So you talk about uh, operating environment, uh, you know, 1,900 Fahrenheit, you know, near the 200 PSI. And the parts can subject to very harsh working environment and they can be burned, correct or corroded, uh, distorted, most important, very challenging to people like us working in the robotics automation. Every part you know, could be repaired, it's uh, individualized, uh, has its own 
geometry and the characteristics. So funny enough, for such a high safety coefficient, size high safety coefficient machines, these pair are repaired not just once, possibly twice, thrice. As long as the distortion is within the tolerance of the FAA. FAA. So we have to parts being worn, then we have to build up with the uh, additive manufacturing. Then it's not to the final shape, particularly repaired parts. And we have to do the grinding polishing to the um, parent uh, materials, not to the design dimension, but to the prior to repair dimension. That's tough part, that's tough part. So we have to solve a, a few fronts. Firstly, it's uh, the materials processing technology. You now, how to build a part layer by layer, and we have tried to different materials. Uh, it is understandable, you know, the, 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 when the high performance materials are made, uh, it's hard to process them into the finishing products. So it's sort of contradicting, you know, you have a high performance materials, but it becomes harder to process and to uh, manufacture it. Uh, in this particular case, we're experimenting repair with the uh, Inconel 738, because this is a very high performance material in a high temperature. Um, but there's a problem with the cracks, you know, and to build up with this uh, robotic cell. And then we have come up with a hybrid um, printing technology to mix, uh, to alternate the printing Inconel 738 and the Inconel, the Inconel 718. Uh, the Yankee 718 is more wordable, more printable, but the performance is not as superior as Inconel 738. So that has been very successful development to optimize the process parameters and use machine learning techniques to seek out the optimal uh, components, optimum process parameters. And this is just another example to that reflect the challenges in uh, remanufacturing. So every part is um, a thin wall, you know, a lot of cooling holes, you know, to keep the uh, part low and from being wet in the high temperature work environment. So every part has a severe part distortions. Just to give you an idea how challenging it is to do remanufacturing. The part distortion is greater than the thickness of the part. So for instance, in this particular part, the thickness is about 1.3 mil. The distortion is over 1.63 mil, still usable. The, the, the FAA, FAA allows this part to be, to be remanufactured, re restored to its prior to repair geometry. So that is the challenge. We need to deal with adaptive material processing, vision, sensor, uh, you know, uh, uh, cloud data process and all these techniques has to be integrated to deliver the solution. So one of the solutions we come through early days, we use uh, various uh, uh, sort of mechanical sensors, you know, LVDG to try to get the distorted uh, uh, surface of the part. But nowadays, we have a more advanced uh, uh, method. And for instance, in this case, we can easily use uh, uh, laser scanner to get a, a point cloud of this distorted surface and uh, to build, to rebuild a surface by through some data processing, 3D construction. Ultimately, we have to uh, plan the robotic grinding path. Right? So this has been proven uh, successful by combining uh, uh, sense and data processing and then adaptive the robot path planning. That's just part of the story. And another part of the story is a severe um, uh, tool wear. So in contrast to conventional machining, you know, using CNC tools, uh, where the tool wear is not so um, uh, severe, you know, pretty, pretty much you preset the cutting parameters that you would expect the finishing dimension. But that's not true for grinding polishing, you're using those uh, grinding, bears and the wheels, because the particular removal is based on hundreds of cutting grains rather than the CNC tools, which is very rigid and well-constructed. 
So loud grains can be born, can be can break out, and that would affect the material the removal rate, hence the finishing dimension. Now there isn't a good way to actually model that kind of material removal with respect to the poor conditions, you know, captured by vision, acoustic sense, or whatever. There's no such a uh, there's no feasible way to actually model to produce a mathematical model to relate a material the remover right, to the uh, tour conditions and the price of the parameters. So I don't personally like this, uh, you know, um, black box model. But sometimes we we have to just rely on it because we lack of any explicit methods. So we rely on the machine learning and techniques. And to use acoustic sensing and Teresa mentioned acoustic, acoustic sensing as well. But we draw, we draw a lesson from a, a manual operator. They can actually uh, sort of detect the material removal rate by you know, listening to the, uh, the, the process. So we, we actually uh, use that as a, a starting point. Get, uh, uh, collect the acoustic signals from process and try to relate to the material removal, right? uh, but, you know, um, corresponding to different uh, grain size, a uh, different uh, uh, contact force, uh, right? So as you can see this uh, uh, experiment result here, which is a very highly nonlinear. And our method, of course, we are not really computer science and AI scientists, so we just have to uh, adapt and uh, apply what is available in this uh, machine learning space. And uh, one of the things uh, we have a mature space in a you know a model, uh, you know neural network model in MATLAB, all kinds of things, but it has to be tricked to. Um, uh, meet the specific problem, uh, uh, solve the problem. For instance, we tried the single layer and the feed forward neural network, but the results just not satisfy in terms of computation and uh, efficiency and the prediction accuracies. So we have to add on algorithm, algorithm to optimize the neural network structure. In this particular example, we use optimally pruned extreme machine an extreme learning machine. It, in essence, is a, uh, a single hidden layer feed forward neural network. But one of the problems we encountered, you know, for instance, in the hidden layer, pretty much in this model, we know how many input variables and how many output variables. Then it's just a try and error. What would be the optimum number of neurons in the hidden layers? So we come up with a formal methodology, right? And to come up to use during this uh, is a, a step start with uh, a large number of neurons in the hidden layers, then rank the neurons use certain uh, regression techniques and prune those who make those cells and that make this contribution to the model. So that is uh, become a, a very helpful tools for us to customize uh, a, general, a general neural network model for this particular materials process. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we use a, a closely signal, and uh, this is just a, a raw signal we collect from the process. And then we have to um, uh, uh, derive uh, five features from those uh, signals as input to the neural network models. And the wide acoustic signal is so interesting because uh, the materials of removal is basically interaction between um, uh, the cutting grains and the materials, and that generates acoustic uh, 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 signal. And that uh, uh, is uh, highly related to the material removal rate, actually to the tool condition, right? To the tool condition. So this is just uh, an feature extraction from this uh, uh, robotic grinding machines. And we can see uh, those um, uh, features, you know, uh, 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 in a different uh, um, frequency band uh, using the wavelet analysis, we can see certain features are more prominent in certain frequency band, right? and uh, this uh, camera uh, input to the neural uh, to the neural neural network model. 
Uh, that stargram just shows, this result just shows how dynamic the material removal rate and corresponding to the tool conditions. With the same tool, as the machining time increase and the, you know, the material removal rate or the material removal sickness increase, not non-linearly, it drops drastically when the tool is relatively new, but it enters sort of relatively steady period and then reduce uh, linear uh, in a linear fashion. Uh, so it's just very hard to come up with the mathematical model. But the black box model, the new network model, you know, handles that well. Right, that's perhaps just gives you some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, feel about, uh, you know, how the sensing, the machine learning um, be applied to really uh, deal with adaptive material processing uh, in additive manufacturing, uh, you know, fine uh, robotic finishing. And then I just perhaps touch on some of the ongoing work and some thoughts on cobalt for uh, material processing. Uh, when uh, uh, when Jonathan approached me about this uh, um, uh, planning center, I was super excited, you know, with the you know experts like uh, um, Peter, you know, you know, Vision and. Uh, and Teresa, you know, the mobile robot and this perception. One of the big questions I'm thinking about throughout this uh, about 25 years of research in robotics automation for material processing is that how we can make robots, right? Sort of emulate the human, the skilled workers, right? And the adaptive environment and to do those in the complex materials process, you know, autonomously. Um, I have been thinking this for many years, um, and I thought it would be nice if the robots like, like human operators, apprentices, by observing, by feel the you know, ex experiments, you know, uh, follow the master, uh, uh, the operators, uh, workers, and can become um, a skilled workers. Right? Now, what if the robot covered a similar problem by observing, amputating, and do some trial, then the sensor can correct. And it's sort of self-learning. That was my sort of um, ideation, you know. Um, so how to get, how to, first, there's a two a stage problem. First, how to acquire the skills and knowledge, you know, sensing, perception, discretize, normalize, to make that understood to robot. That's first stage. Then that stage is done, how we can actually transfer the kind of skills and knowledge to robot. So that's sort of uh, my um, as, uh, sort of aspiration for this, uh, for our PhD involved in the training center. So we started a couple of years ago to experiment what would be the best methods to actually acquire other skills and knowledge. Obviously, you know, the perception part and the imaging part, motion part, people have been doing this for decades, I'm sure it's still uh, meaningful, right? Particularly to perceive, to detect the operator's posture in doing, so, in doing particular manufacturing task in assembly, sorting, or wording, polishing. And another aspect would be a kind of a, a wearable sensors, right? Like a data gloves or a wearable um, EMG, electromyograph sensors, a forced myograph, uh, uh, a forced myography. The EMG, we have seen lots of publications in the rehabilitation. There's a problem with the sensitivity, drift, you know, dynamics. It's just um, very hard to get uh, the precise uh, information about the human activities for EMG. But I'm sure it's still a big research scope. It turns out from a large preview, uh, sort of literature, the force of myography is more stable in detecting the physical activities. So we have been experimenting to grab a bottle, grab a tools, and see the response of myography. So currently, my postgraduate you know, focus on those um, uh, my force of myography, myography to detecting the physical activities. But I think in the future, it will be multi model uh, knowledge skills uh, uh, acquisition. Uh, another strand would be mixed reality for intuitive teleoperation. 
this research, research problem uh, uh, arose from my interaction with the worders. The worders were telling me, would it be nice if I don't do wording, I just do dummy um, sort of demonstration, you know, you holding a van, right? Going through this uh, wording geometry and the robot would be just doing that. So then the question is sometimes it's hard for the word to access certain constrained space. And then we come up with this big strategy for intuitive calibration. So a bridge between a physical space and the user space. In between is a mixed reality, that means it's a, uh, a virtual reality plus what's been seen by robot through a uh, multi-view um, uh, vision systems. So that creates a mixed um, reality subspace and then the operator, for instance, a word can actually teach the robot how to do the, how to do the wording. So I'm quite excited about this um, word Australia, you know, whether we can actually um, uh, use some of the concept to do um, uh, robotic robot learning and uh, for wording operation. And another thing is about is a uh, it's a very relate very much related to the um, cobalt is about the, the contact force and the torque estimation. It started with the lava um, robot grinding and the polishing. Just keep watching my time. Yeah. Uh, uh, the robotic grinding operations. So it's important to um, control the contact force between the robotic robot tools and the workspace. It's, there, there are uh, different approaches. For instance, a common approach would be an expensive external force tech sensor and six component, give you six, three components, uh, X, uh, force components and the three uh, torque components. It's uh, quite expensive. It's uh, it has its deficiencies. Right? And another um, direction would be using um, internal signals to actually uh, calculate or estimate the contact force between the environment and the robot hand. And uh, then there are many publications using motor current, current signals to estimate this kind of external uh, range. You know, if a robot is in contact with the, the environment, and they, through their motor currents, right, we can actually predict the force and the torque. But the conventional common filter is being used, but I, the, the results is not a, uh, uh, the, the results are less than uh, desired. And took, and the response time is long, the prediction accuracy is not uh, uh, as high as uh, uh, the application demanded. So we have been looking into um, adaptive common filter, right? So in, it's basically a switch, a mode switch movement average uh, superimposed on the standard common filter. Right? So we, uh, it's actually uh, switching between a uh, hard movement average, HMA, and the weight movement average, depending on the context states. Uh, so that gives an uh, adaptive sort of filtering um, result. So let's address the work. And the results has been very promising, actually. We experiment, we, we actually validate this uh, adaptive common filter with the dual robot arm, you know, the two robots you know, holding a common object and with a varying weight, uh, varying load. And we we'll compare um, uh, the adaptive common filter you know, uh, with a uh, weighting bubble average without uh, also conventional common filter. And the user there can see that uh, uh, this green line is a conventional common filter. The response time is longer, is much longer than the adaptive common filter. And of course, the tracking accuracy uh, for the active uh, adaptive common filter, you know, outperforms the conventional common filter. So that is a, some of the, some of the um, preliminary result from our ongoing research. Hopefully, it can be expanded you know, into robotics for uh, manufacturing. Yeah, that's pretty much what I can share with everyone. And hopefully, we have some questions. The time for questions and answers. I just stop my sharing here now. Thanks, Chachi. Um, any questions?
Yeah, great presentation, um, both Teresa and Xiaoxi. Um, got a question about the using acoustic sensing modality to uh, classify um, the removal of material for the repair um, process. Mm. Um, yeah, yep. uh, the, the, the material removal rate, the, there is a, yep. theor there's a theoretical model you now, how it, uh, actually I didn't show in the slides, there is a formula for um, a material removal rate. Um, in our classification, <laughs> we have two methods. One is just a uh, classify in terms of um, the thickness uh, of a removal. Another is a volume, uh, you know, material removal volume rate. Uh, pretty much consistent with the, what a textbook is defined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but certainly uh, the model is very different from the idea of textbook model. Uh, so mm -hmm. We have to rely on the neural network model. Yeah, really interesting. So I, I was wondering, do you have, uh, what, do you, what do you think about applying that to other manufacturing process uh, processes? Have you sort of thought about that? Um, yeah. For example, like what, like you know, classifying whether weld was done correctly yeah, okay. or if there's a de mm. defect or something like that. Yeah, entirely possible. Actually, as I said, I, I I'm not a fan of this black box. I, I'm not a fan. I mean, when we have no choice, we just have to work on the data. So I was a fan of a physical physics model to be used mm. as much as possible. Now, in answer, in, in response to your question, we have been experimenting this with the additive manufacturing wording. Now wording is a very sophisticated process. You know, you have a word pool is not a metallurgy. Then the pool solidify forms the shape of the word. Man. There have been tons of materials about how to do uh, optimal control to achieve the perfect word. Man. We have been doing that. We start with the first principle. For instance, in, in determining the the, the form the geometry from an additive manufacturing, let's say there's a uh, direct energy deposition, we start the first principle. So that's energy. There's so much energy going into this part, going into this part. And this, man, this energy will create a weather pool. And then there's a um, thermal field. And this thermal field in this environment that will solidify. So we start with this. Why we start this? Rather than just pure data, we think in the thermal dynamics, all those physics are still relevant. Uh, I think I can tell you it's very promising. So we recently produced a paper, it's called um, PINN, PINN is physics informed neural network model. It's not just a pure data model. So I thought, I hope in some time I can share with the colleagues here. I'm a fan of physics model being used as much as possible in machine learning. Yeah, I agree. Constraining the learning process with some prior knowledge, like a physics model. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with your yeah. philosophy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, certainly I encourage my students to do that. And uh, when he talking to you, I hope that message is, that message is strong. Um, yeah, uh, back in the model, a bit more explainable. Yeah. Mm. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Perhaps about Teresa as well. Teresa, I have a question on this uh, adaptive localization. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, really involved in this local uh, slam. What do you introduce as uh, adaptive uh, slam? Is it, can we call this adaptive slam? Oh, sorry, uh, active slam. Mm. Yeah, active yeah, slam. yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, you can, we've, we've done, many active slam systems to improve. So the one I presented here was to improve calibration. So where do we move to calibrate better an IMU and an yeah. ILA? Mm. Uh, but we can use active slam for uh, better localization, for better mapping. So it, there are many, many approaches. We've, we've, I've tried many of those, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. I think pretty much we are. Any other questions? Okay, so I think we can. Thank you. 
we're gonna yeah. stop there. Yeah. yeah, thank you everyone.